everybody this morning? Awesome. 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 Hey, if you have a Bible, I hope you do. Second Thessalonians is where we will be this morning. A new book of the Bible for us. If you're wondering where that was, you remember how last week we were in first Thessalonians? Let's just right next door. So you're welcome for that. So New Testament, uh, Colossians is right before, I believe. Yep. And then you got first and second Thessalonians. So, hey, uh, I missed you guys last week. Nobody missed me, but I missed you guys. <laughs> Total silence, right? Um, no, it was it was awesome though to watch on the live stream. Pastor Mike did an amazing job, and uh, as always, worship was amazing. And really, really uh, missed being with you all. I was in Savannah, Georgia, officiating a wedding for my stepsister, so we had a really good time down there. Uh, got back on Monday, and on Tuesday, I got to finish uh, Pastor Mike's sermon, and I, I sent him a text because I just said, "Man, I, I was just so humbled and honored." Uh, that he um, asked you guys to to pray for me and my family. He, I think, said something to the extent that uh, that I, your pastor has a bullseye on him or something like that. And then he said, just be be praying for him. Well, uh, about 30 minutes after I finished watching that, I got in my truck and started driving into Murfreesboro to pick up some groceries. And I was in a terrible car accident. And uh, pretty fortunate to walk out of there alive, to be honest, but without a scratch. And the other driver also did not have a scratch. and So I, I'm saying that for two reasons. Number one, thank you for praying for me. <laughs> Number two, prayer works. Amen. Right? So when the Bible commands us as believers to pray for each other without ceasing, I, man, I'm just a testimony of the fact that that's a real thing. And so I want to just encourage us in this house to continue to do that for one another when we feel like the Holy Spirit has put someone on our hearts and minds to lift up in prayer, there's probably a good reason. And so I just want to say thank you. I love you guys all so much. This week we have just felt such an outpouring of kindness and love um, just in our family for that. So thank you. Um, thank you for that. And my, my Georgia license plate on the front of my truck is shattered. Um, I'm most heartbroken about that. Uh, but I get to get a new one after they win the national championship this year. So there's that. Um, no, but thank you, for, thank you for praying for us. Um, before we uh, dive into this new book of the Bible, can we pray together? And um, then we'll dive into this today. So Father, in, in this week we are going to be celebrating with friends and family and practicing gratitude and thankfulness. But Lord, we want to start now and just say thank you. Um, thank you for your protection. Thank you for your provision. Lord, I know for some of us this year, we've experienced heartache and loss and sorrow and pain. But at the same time, God, we've also experienced your goodness in many other ways. And Lord, even if you did nothing else for us, you have still done more than enough through sending your son, Jesus. And so God, in this moment, we just want to say thank you for who you are Thank you for your goodness and your mercy and your love towards us. And we don't deserve any of it, but you still show us so much goodness. Lord, as uh, we open your word this morning, as we read from it, we pray that our hearts and our ears and our eyes would be open just to the truth of this word, that you would speak to us, Lord. And God, that, that we would just be obedient and faithful with whatever it is you would say to us, God. Help us to apply it to our lives, to not just be hearers, but doers also of this word. We pray for every church in Cannon County, Lord, bigger than us, smaller than us, different from us. It doesn't matter, Lord, if they're preaching and proclaiming this gospel that Jesus is Lord. We pray that you would bless them, you would grow them. Help us to be united under one name, the name of Jesus. We love you. We praise you. 
It's in Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. So 2 Thessalonians is where we will be this morning. But as we begin a, a study of a book of the Bible, one thing I always like to do is, is to look a little bit at the background of this book of the Bible, why it was written, who wrote it, and who were the people that would have been receiving this. This book of the Bible is actually a letter to a group of believers, the same group of believers that 1 Thessalonians was written to. And so if you're with us the last five weeks or so, um, we saw that in this city of Thessalonica, the Apostle Paul had planted this church and he established it. And most of 1 Thessalonians is him telling these guys, you're doing so good, keep going, keep following Jesus. But shortly after he wrote that letter, the Apostle Paul received this report that this young church had accepted a claim that the day of the Lord or the return of Christ had already happened. And so there was a tremendous amount of doctrinal confusion that this young church was walking in. And this seems to be the reason why Paul wrote this second letter. Not only that, the persecution in the city of Thessalonica against Christians had apparently gotten worse. And so Paul sends them this second letter, probably only a few months after the first letter, around AD 49 to 51, while he was in the city of Corinth. If you weren't with us as we studied 1 Thessalonians, one of the things we said is that the city of Thessalonica would have been in modern Greece. This was written during the time of the Roman Empire. So most of the people in the Thessalonian church would have been first generation Christians. A lot of them would have been influenced very heavily by pagan worship. And so it was a very ethnically and culturally diverse city. A lot of them are first generation Christians, young Christians. So a lot of what Paul is writing we can read this and be super hard on these believers because like, man, you don't know that, right? They've been Christians for maybe two or three months, and a lot of them didn't grow up this way. Uh, for Second Thessalonians is really, really short. It's only three chapters. And because it is written in response to some very specific issues, Paul's going to get right to the point. Um, every chapter deals with a specific issue. The first chapter deals with this idea of hope in spite of persecution. It was hard to be a Christian in Thessalonica, and yet what Paul is encouraging these believers with is the fact that they have hope, and it's different from what the world has. Chapter 2 is all about the day of the Lord, that Jesus is coming back. And one of the things that Paul says is, hey, some of you have accepted this claim that the day of the Lord's already happened, but I need you to know some things have to take place before that happens. Let's talk a bit about biblical prophecy. And so he's going to talk a bit about someone called the man of lawlessness. The book of Revelation refers to this character as the beast. Other parts of scripture, like 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, talk about this as the Antichrist. And so that's going to be a lot of fun, right? <laughs> Especially like during the holidays, right? What you guys talk about at your church during the holidays? The Antichrist, right? So we're going to take two weeks and talk about chapter 2. And then chapter 3 deals with this issue of idle Christians. There were some Christians in this church that just said, well, Jesus is coming back any day, so I'm just not going to work. I've got a mansion over the hilltop, so I don't need to worry about paying my rent here, right? And Paul's saying, no, while we wait, we need to be busy. We need to be working. We need to be building the kingdom of God. So why would we read and study 2 Thessalonians today? Well, as confused as this young church was, it has been something that I've seen, and I'm sure many of you have, that there is a lot of confusion right now in modern Christianity about how we are to respond to persecution and marginalization from the culture at large. You've heard me say this before, but I'll say it again. It is going to get harder to be a Christian in the United States of America in the years to come. And if we're not ready for that, and we don't understand what it looks like to live for Christ, and we're confused about how we respond to that, we're, we're going to be lost when it comes to that. One of the things we must ask ourselves is this. Do we get angry and respond to the world's irrational hatred of us with even more hatred and vitriol? They hate us, and they misunderstand us, and they accuse us of being this and that and the other. How do we respond to that? Do we respond like Jesus, or do we respond with more hatred and vitriol? Uh, is our hope placed as Christians in someday winning a culture war, or is it placed in the Lord's return? What Paul is saying to these believers is, guys, Jesus is coming back, but before he does, I just need you to know it's going to get really bad. And some of us as Christians, we're not ready for that. 
Some of us, our vision for the future and what God wants to do in us is a Chick-fil-A on every corner and Christian music on all the radio stations, right? And that's, that's what we're living for and hoping for. And listen, as awesome as that would be to have a Chick-fil-A here in Woodbury, the Bible says that it's going to get less and less and less and less and less popular to be a Christian, that we're going to get more and more marginalized, we're going to get more and more persecuted, and then Jesus is going to come back, and then we're going to be with him for all eternity. And so we need to understand what the scripture is saying about that. Uh, another reason I think that this is so important for us to study is there's a lot of confusion in the modern church that surrounds the second coming of Christ. You just want to have some fun in a Bible study full of people from different church backgrounds. Just talk about when Jesus comes back, like lighting a hand grenade and rolling it out. And, okay, let's see what happens, right? Because we're kind of confused, not just about how that's supposed to happen, when that's supposed to happen, where that's supposed to happen. We're also confused about how we are to live until that day happens. And for many people, including the people in this church, they had gotten wrapped up in speculation about timelines. But what Jesus made very clear in the book of Matthew is that nobody knows the day or the hour. Not even that guy on YouTube that claims to know the day or the hour, right? Nobody does. And so getting wrapped up, and I think it's already happened. It happened last March, or I think it's going to happen this October. Like, no, we don't know. But that's really not the point of any of the passages of scriptures that tell us to be ready. They're telling us to be ready so that we can be busy building his kingdom until that day comes. That we can be busy doing what he's called us to do until that day comes. And listen, all of the passages that talk about the return of Christ, all of the scriptures and Bible verses, none of that is ever meant to bring about fear and anxiety in the people of God. If when you talk about that in your Bible study, or you read that and you're just like, oh, I'm just so afraid, oh, then, then you're not reading it the way it's intended to be read. It's never meant to bring around pride where we read it and we go, well, that other church across the street doesn't know what we know about this. We finally cracked the code, right? 2,000 years people have been trying and we've figured it out, right? It's also not meant to bring about speculation about timelines. We have our newspaper in this hand and our Bible and we go, oh, this happened, this happened. Okay, carry the Greek over here. You mix these letters around and that's what it says. Boom, right? <laughs> Next April, right? No, it's meant to inspire hope. It's meant to inspire faithfulness and endurance and diligence, even when it's hard to follow Jesus in this life, we have a hope that the world does not have because we know Jesus is coming back and this world is not our home. Hallelujah. Because listen, what you hope for shapes what you live for. If your hope is simply on your life being so comfortable and convenient and that's what you're living for, you're not going to be living for Jesus. You're going to be living for yourself. If your hope is all in winning the culture war, you're going to be very disappointed when broken, flawed men and women let you down. But if your hope is in the king and the coming kingdom, you're going to be living for him here and now, and you will never be put to shame. Isn't that good news? So if you have a Bible, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting in verse 1, let's read this together. This is God's word. Paul, Silvanus, that's Silas, and Timothy... To the church of the Thessalonians in God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and the afflictions that you are enduring. So just like in the first letter to the Thessalonians, actually, authorship is attributed equally to three very important figures in the life of this church. We know ultimately Paul was the writer of this, but Paul credits Silas and Timothy as well. Because these three people were together, we can speculate that this is probably written only a few months after the first letter was written. And Paul begins this letter with his customary greeting, grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus. And then he says, we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because, and he lists some things that are happening in their lives that he's really grateful for. And the first thing he says is, your faith is growing abundantly. And he's grateful for that. 
He's led, he's led many of them to faith in Christ. He's baptized many of them. He's discipled some of them. Timothy was later sent to disciple some of them and came back with a great report. And this is so encouraging to Paul that, man, they're, they're growing. Yeah, there's still some issues. There's still some confusion doctrinally that he's going to talk about later. But for the most part, they're growing. And so when we read this, we have to ask ourselves this question. Is that happening in my life? Do you know what should be happening in your life, right? Because if you plant a tree in your front yard and that tree has life in it, it's going to grow. It's going to produce fruit. And if that's not happening, it could be two things going on. Number one, the environment is not letting that tree grow like it should grow, or that tree could be dead and not have any life in it. And the same thing could be said about our spiritual life. Maybe the reason we're not growing is because we're not putting ourselves in the kind of environment to help us grow. We're not reading the word. We're not around other believers. That's why we're not growing. Or maybe we don't have any spiritual life in us. We don't truly know Christ. And so the question we should all be asking ourselves is this. Do I look more like Jesus today than I did a year ago? It doesn't mean I'm perfect, but it does mean I'm taking steps forward to love Jesus more. And what am I doing to grow in my faith? So growth is God's vision for all the disciples of Jesus. And this is something Paul thanks God for. He also says this in verse 3. He says, the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. So because their faith in Jesus was growing, their love for other people was also growing. So a sign that we're truly growing in Christ, a sign that we're looking more like Jesus, is that our hearts are softening towards other people. That we're growing kinder, that we're growing more compassionate to the people around us. We've embraced this myth in American Christianity that says you can be as rude and unkind and compassionless to the people around you as you want, as long as you're right. That's the only thing that matters. (laughs) I need you to hear me. Truth and love are not opposing forces. Just look at the life of Christ. He spoke some hard truths, didn't he? But he always spoke them in love. And in the same, in our lives, we can hold firm to truth and we can still be people of love. And a sign that we're growing closer to Christ is that we're also growing in love and kindness and compassion towards the people around us. And then in verse 4, he says this, we're also boasting about your steadfastness in faith and all your persecutions and the afflictions that you're enduring. So it was really hard to be a follower of Jesus in the city of Thessalonica. Perhaps one of the reasons Paul talks about the resurrection and death and the second coming of Christ is because there were actual martyrs in this church. But in spite of all those things that they had faced, One of the things Paul was so grateful for is that they still had endurance and steadfastness and faithfulness in their relationship with the Lord. And what this tells us that someone who has a genuine faith, a real faith, is someone whose faith endures. Someone that when it's really hard to be a Christian, for some reason they're still able to continue to follow Jesus. This is evidence that it's real. And that hope that we are called to have is not like the hope the world has. We have a hope in the midst of all the things that we go through that someday every trial, every suffering, and every affliction will come to an end. Why? Because Jesus is coming back. And this world is not our home. The Bible says that our afflictions are light and they're momentary. So in these first four verses, there's a couple of things that we notice. The first is genuine faith in Christ is meant to grow. If it's not growing, there's a real issue. Like that plant in your front yard that you plant and it's not growing. Two years, three years, ten years go by, it's not growing. Either it's dead or it doesn't have the right environment around it to make it grow. And the same in our spiritual lives. Either there's no spiritual life in us or we're not in the kind of environment to help us grow in Christ. Second thing we see is genuine faith in Christ produces in our lives love for others as we grow closer to Christ. And if we're unkind jerks to people and think that's okay because we're right... There's a real issue. We don't understand the heart of God towards other people, and we really don't know God like we're claiming to know God. The third thing that we see is that genuine faith in Christ should produce in our lives hope, even when things get hard. Call me crazy, but I don't think God's vision for his people is for us to be a bunch of sanctified chicken littles, right? We walk around, oh, the sky is falling, it's so bad, right? And we're just negative and hopeless about everything. Oh, did you see what happened? Oh, it's so sure scary out there, right? Okay, yeah, I know that it can be scary looking at things happening in the world, but we're not called to be negative and hopeless people. We're called to be people who are full of hope. We're called to be people who 
have a positive outlook. Not that we're Pollyannas walking around and just ignore our problems, but we understand that nothing we go through here that's hard and difficult and painful is permanent. Praise God for that. So we're people of hope. Let's look at these next few verses. Look at verse 5. This is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God. That's a very interesting verse. So he says, this is evidence. What what is he referring to when he says this? Well, the answer to that is actually verse 4 when he says, your steadfastness and faith and all your persecutions. That is evidence of the righteous judgment of God. That's an interesting concept. I'll unpack that here in a minute. That you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might, when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Verse 5 is a really interesting verse. I've read this passage of scripture many times and I don't think I ever noticed this. What he's saying is this, which is their steadfastness and faith in all of their persecutions and afflictions, that is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God. What an interesting thought. What is he saying? What he's saying is the truth of the gospel's power, the truth of the indwelling Holy Spirit, the truth of the fact that God is coming back in righteous judgment, that is evidenced by the fact that these believers had the ability to stay faithful to Jesus even in the midst of persecution. What he seems to be saying is that their endurance was an apologetic for the truth of the coming kingdom. Right now there are 215 million Christians around the world that are actively being persecuted for their testimony of faith in Jesus Christ. They're losing their lives. Some of them are losing their homes, their family members. Some of them are being imprisoned. And I want to ask you a question. If this is all a hoax and this is all fake, explain that to me. 215 million people around the world willing to die for this? 11 out of the 12 apostles were martyred for their claim that Jesus was Lord and Jesus rose from the grave. The one that was not martyred, he was boiled alive at a dinner party. (laughs) And when that didn't work, when they couldn't turn him into Kentucky Fried Chicken, they sent him to an island so he could die on an island by himself, right? And so we look at that and we go, huh, there might be something to that. Could it be that the Spirit of God that dwells inside of us, that gives us the ability to endure when it doesn't make sense to an unbelieving world, is actually a testimony that this is real? That this is true? This isn't a hoax? This isn't a fairy tale? This isn't a myth? This isn't made up? This is true? God is coming back? And when we stand for Jesus, even when it gets tough, that's an evidence of that. And not only that, the worthiness of the kingdom of God was displayed and demonstrated by these Christians' ability and willingness to suffer for their faith. Now he says their worthiness of the kingdom of God, it's not that they're able to attain their salvation somehow through their suffering. It simply demonstrates that their salvation was real because they were willing to suffer for it. So listen, if your faith in Jesus costs you nothing, it probably is worth nothing to you. But if your faith in Jesus costs you something, it is invaluable to you. And the fact that these believers had a cost associated with following Jesus, Paul says that's evidence that you belong to the kingdom. And then Paul writes some very encouraging words to them. He says, listen, someday God is going to repay everybody that afflicts you. And he's going to repay them with affliction. Now, what's interesting is if you study the history of the early church, most of the people that persecuted the early church were all Jewish. Paul, before he became a follower of Jesus, persecuted the early church. He was Jewish. And he actually wrote that the reason he did it is he thought he was doing God a favor. He thought that God was going to reward him for cleansing the purity of Judaism. Around the world right now, 
in most places of heavy persecution, it's usually militant Islam. That's the cause of persecution against Christians. And most of the people that persecute Christians that are militantly Islamic, they do so because they think they're doing God a favor. That's going to earn them salvation in the eyes of Allah. But what Paul says is that when they stand before God and they've been guilty of bloodshed and persecution, of violence against Christians, God is going to repay them, but not with rewards, with affliction. Why is he writing that to them? Because he's saying, listen, guys, the vengeance does not belong to you. It belongs to God. And God is able to repay them justly, better than you'll ever be able to repay them. So let God do what he's going to do. Not only that, God is going to judge those who cause affliction. But listen, he's also going to grant relief to those who are afflicted. As Americans, we read that and we go, okay, think about how these words would be received by that pastor in China who's been in jail for 10 years. Or those believers in North Korea that have been in prison camps for a couple of decades because their testimony of faith in Jesus and the word of God says someday relief is coming. Someday the pain, the animosity, and the persecution, that's going to come to an end and God is not just going to grant you relief, he's going to reward you. Every bit of suffering and hardship and pain that you went through because of your testimony of faith in Jesus as Lord, God sees, God knows, and he's going to reward you for that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When is he going to do this? Well, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And the return of Jesus for us, man, that should be like an exciting thought. Relief from the pains of this life. Reward for the things that we've done to follow Jesus faithfully. But for those who do not know Christ, that's a terrifying thought. This is what he says. Those who do not know God, those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ... When he says that statement, what he probably has in mind is not people who are ignorant to the gospel. They will also have to stand before the Lord, give an account for their lives. But what he has in mind most likely are those who heard the gospel. And instead of responding with obedience and faith, they responded with disbelief, with rebellion, and even irrational hatred and violence towards people who did believe. And what Paul is saying is for them, this day is going to be a terrible day. Not a happy day, not a good day, not a victorious day. A day of fire, vengeance, and judgment. Now, how many of you know that this is a very unpopular teaching in modern circles? You you, you saying this, that there is a God that will judge people and send them to hell. For some people, they hear you saying that, and they say, that's crazy talk. And they may even say, that's like microaggression, and that's miniature violence, and that's, right? I mean, we've just lost our mind with this. Because some of us read this and in our mind we go, that's just not fair. How could God send anybody to hell? Can I let you in on a little secret? None of this thing called the Christian gospel is fair. (laughs) Because if God was fair, he would have wiped out the human race in Genesis chapter 3 when they sinned against him. But that's not what God did. He didn't show fairness. He showed mercy. And he showed grace. And he showed so much mercy and grace and love that he made a way for humanity to fellowship with him through his own son being offered in their place. That is unbelievable, ridiculous, scandalous grace that none of us could ever deserve. So God is not fair. And aren't you grateful for that? Because if he was fair, we'd all be in hell. But God is just. And so the justice of God is this. For those who want nothing to do with God in this life, And all through their life, they say, I don't want God. I don't want his presence. I don't want his commands. I don't want his decrees. I want to do what I want to do. And God, I want you to leave me alone. God will say in the end, absolutely, I will deliver you over to the fulfillment of your desires. And the Bible says that separation from the presence of God is a place of utter and total darkness, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, a place of fire. Because think, everything that you enjoy here on this earth the beautiful sunset, the beautiful colors of fall, the joy of your family and all the gifts that God gives. It's because the Bible says the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. Everything good we enjoy, whether we're a Christian or not a Christian, is because God's presence is here on this earth. God is the source of everything beautiful, good, and true. But imagine if the source of everything beautiful, good, and true was removed from your existence entirely for an eternity. You would be left with a place of utter darkness and shame and pain and remorse, and fire. And so this is justice, though. And this is what the Bible says about those who refuse to obey the gospel. But to his saints, 
Christ's coming will not only be something we marvel at, his glory will be shown in those who belong to him. It says in verse 10, he will be glorified in his saints. That's a reference to something the Bible talks about that's called glorification. That someday you will get a new, perfect, glorified, resurrected body and the glory of God will be shown in you. I don't know what your glorified body is going to look like. Mine's going to have an eight pack, right? No more premature, marrow pattern baldness, right? Just beautiful, long hair, right? But, but listen, um, his glory is going to be shown in us. And that's the most amazing miracle about this thing called the gospel. God looks at us broken, jacked up, messed up, rebellious sinners, and he remakes us and renews us, and then he shows his glory in us, and he calls us his bride, and he says, I want to spend an eternity with you. And on that day, we're going to marvel at his glory. And who's going to marvel? Those who accepted the testimony of the apostles. What was their testimony? The fact that Jesus is Lord. And so we're going to see his glory, and his glory is going to be shown in us. It's an amazing thought, isn't it? Look at these last two verses. Look at verse 11. To this end... We always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. After every section of teaching in 2 Thessalonians, Paul offers prayers for this church. And what that tells us is that while learning sound doctrine and biblical teaching and podcasting good sermons and reading good theology books and hearing good Bible teaching, all that stuff is really, really good. Listen, ultimately it's God the Holy Spirit that has to implant that word deep into our hearts. It has to make that 18 inch journey from here to here. Because for a lot of us, what can happen is we get filled up with a lot of things up here that ultimately never are implemented into our lives. We become like what the Word says. We're we're hearers of the Word, but we're not doers of it. And so what Paul is doing is he's praying that everything he's spoken to them might be implanted in their hearts so that it's manifested in their lives. And he's praying to them because, man, he's praying for them because he's utterly dependent on God to make that growth happen. This is what he wrote about in 1 Corinthians 3. He says it's God that gives the growth. God has to do that work and that miracle in us. And he prays that God may make them worthy. It's an interesting thought. See, none of us deserve and none of us are worthy of God's call for salvation. And yet God graciously and mercifully extended that call to us as an act of grace. But after we receive that call that none of us are worthy of, we are compelled and we are empowered by God to live in such a way that is fitting, or another word for that is, worthy of such an incredible honor. That we are to live lives that look like people who have received the call for salvation. Now, ultimately, it's God that makes and transforms our lives to be this way, to make us worthy. Yet, we all have a responsibility to be obedient and faithful. Uh, Philippians 2.12 is an interesting verse. It says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That implies responsibility and obedience, doesn't it? But look at the second half of that verse. Yet it is God who works in you, both for his good will and his good pleasure. So who does the work, God or us? God, right? Some of us say us, some of us say God. And the answer is God, but through us, because we're choosing to be obedient, right? So there's this tension between our responsibility and God's sovereignty and God's work in our lives. But it's ultimately God that makes us worthy. And he's praying that God would fulfill every resolve for good. Here's what a Christian is. If you're new to this, you have no idea what it means to be a Christian. What are Christians? Are Christians people that have, you know, different beverage choice when they go to Applebee's or Christians people who vote a certain way and go to Chick-fil-A instead of McDonald's? What's a Christian, right? Christian is someone who has experienced the goodness of God and been forgiven radically by God. That's what a Christian is. They're not perfect people. They're forgiven people. People who've experienced the radical goodness of God and the grace of Jesus. That God resolved to show us while we were yet sinners his goodness through the undeserved sacrifice of Jesus and through the gift of the Holy Spirit that none of us deserved, but yet God resolved to show us his goodness through Jesus. And then in this crazy twist, he somehow 
has planned to use us as broken, jacked up people that he is restoring through an act of grace to show his goodness to the world through us. That's his plan. He wants to use you. He wants to use me. He is resolved to show his goodness through us. And Paul is praying that God may fulfill every resolve for good through these people and every work of faith by his power. So how do we live lives fitting or worthy for this call of salvation? Well, one of the ways we do that is that we practice works of faith by his power. What does it mean to practice works of faith? It means that because we believe him and we have faith in him as our Lord, we're willing to obey him even when it doesn't make sense. We're willing to even take risks when he's calling us to take risk, we're willing to live in certain ways where we attempt big things for his kingdom. And as we do, we see his work done in us. We see his work done through us. We see his work around us. It's a good work that we do, but we don't do it for our glory, for our name. Every good work that we do in Jesus' name is a work of reliance on him. And it's done by his power. It's not done by our power. And what Paul is saying is he's saying that you would do this so that the name of the Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him. So ultimately, everything we do, we're called to do it so that we represent the name of the Lord Jesus well to an unbelieving world. And how we live, how we serve, how we speak, how we treat those around us, that we bring his name glory and honor when we represent his character well. But in the same sense, we bring him dishonor in our lives when we don't. And so what Paul is saying is, I'm praying that God will be glorified in your life. How is God glorified in our life when we're going through hard times? Some of us, we read this and we're like, man, that sounds great when I'm like doing awesome things for God and serving in ministries and taking big risks and God's just showing his glory. But how can I do that when I'm suffering? How can I do that when I'm going through a hard season? It's an interesting thought to me that as we suffer in this life as a follower of Jesus, that's actually a sign that we're following Jesus because we're willing to follow him even when it's hard. It's actually a sign that we're participating in the kingdom of God because we're willing to continue to endure because we know something better is coming. It's actually evidence that Christianity is true. There's 215 million believers around the world that each and every day their lives are on the line because of their testimony of faith in Jesus is Lord. They are preaching the gospel to an unbelieving world saying this is true. It's not a myth. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a philosophy. It's not just a mental construct. It's a reality. And so in our lives, when we're going through a hard time and we're somehow, some way still enduring and following Jesus, we should take comfort to know that that's an evidence that we belong to the Lord. I think for some of us, it's really hard because we've embraced this mythology that says that Christianity is just about us being more comfortable and us being happier and healthier and us getting our best life now, right? Right? We say, I want to follow Jesus. But the whole suffering thing, I don't know about that, right? All the other good stuff, I want to follow him. But if we really want to follow Jesus, and we look at the Gospels, and we look and see what it's about, why should it surprise us so much that suffering is also a part of it? There's an 11-year age difference between me and my youngest brother. And growing up, he wanted to follow me, and he wanted to be like me in a lot of things that I did. So one of the things my other brother and my cousins and my high school friends enjoyed on Saturdays in the backwoods of Georgia, because there's really nothing else to do, is we like to shoot each other with paintball guns. Anybody ever played paintball, right? If you're like, what in the world is paintball? It's, there's these guns, and you got CO2 things on the end of it, and you shoot each other with paintballs, which it feels like you're getting hit by a marble through a slingshot when you get hit. It's not fun, right? When you're in high school, you're like, awesome, here's my battle scars, right? And you got it on your neck and in your hand, you're like, yeah, cool, right? So my little brother, he's 11 years younger than me, he was in kindergarten when I was a senior in high school. So, like, he never really played paintball with us, right? But every time I'd come back for Christmas break or Thanksgiving break from college, I would meet up with all my old friends, and we'd play paintball together, and we'd just have a great old redneck time, right, shooting each other and wearing camo and running through the woods. It was great. But one Christmas break, my mom said, hey, um, I got to go shopping or something. Will you just watch your brother today? I said, Mom, I, I'm going to go play paintball with some buddies. She goes, that's okay. Just take him with you. I was like, well... 
mom, I don't think like, hey, this is, like we shoot each other. She's like, oh, he'll be fine. He's old enough. He's 11. He's 10, whatever he was at the time. I said, all right. So I said, buddy, hey, listen, we're going to go play paintball, but you need to know um, if you get shot, it hurts. Do you still want to play? He's like, yeah. Am I going to be with you? And I was like, yeah. Am, am I going to be like doing what you, are you going to play paintball? I'm going to play paintball. Okay. So as long as I'm with you, yeah, man, I'm going to follow you and do what you do. I said, okay. So he got his little camo outfit and his mask, and he got a gun, and he's just like, oh, cool, I'm an army guy. And he's walking around, and the game starts. He's with me, right? And I'm like, let's get to the back of the field. Let's bunker down, right? We're going to play defense today. And so the game's going great. You know, we're shooting. They're shooting back. Jonathan, my younger brother, is kind of crouching down, just kind of, hey, like, I'm in the army, right? It's like this Halo game I've been playing on Xbox. I'm like, yeah, shut up, just shoot, right? You know, and he's not even paying attention. And so the game starts to turn against us and everybody on my team starts to get out and I see there's three or four guys and they're approaching. I'm doing my best. I'm, I'm like, you know, losing pretty terribly. And all of a sudden, right at the end, these four guys stand up and run towards our bunker and I get shot and I get hit and I call out hit. And right when I did, I hear a strange sound from my little brother's mouth. You ever seen the movie Gone with the Wind, the Civil War amputation ward in the hospital, Right. <laughs> There was this blood-curdling scream that came up from him, and it was so violent and so real. They stopped the game, and the owner of the field came out to make sure he hadn't broken his femur, right? <laughs> and he's writhing on the ground. Ah, I've been shot, right? We pull him aside. Are you okay? It hurts, right? And we're like, yeah. Yeah, I told you it hurt, Right? He goes, but I wanted to be with you. I said, well, yeah, you were with me. I got shot too. He's like, well, I thought as long as I was with you, I was going to be okay. I said, You're, you are okay, but like, you're going to get shot at because we're in a paintball war, dude. You know, I think for many of us as Christians, we still have that same mindset. We go, as long as I'm with Jesus, I'm going to be okay. And listen, we are going to be okay, but we're still going to be shot at because this is a spiritual war. If we say we want to follow Jesus and we want to be like Jesus and we want to do the life of Jesus in our life, we've got to understand in the life of Jesus, Jesus suffered pain and hardship and suffering. Jesus was unappreciated and taken advantage of. If you follow him and you do the works that he did, you're going to be unappreciated and taken advantage of. And it's going to be painful. It's going to hurt sometimes. Remember Luke 17, Jesus heals 10 people from leprosy. Only one of them comes back and says, thank you. I'm glad that was Jesus and not me. I'd have been like, boom, leprosy back, right? Until I'm not going to heal you till you apologize, right? <laughs> but when we follow him, man, there's so many times when we just feel taken advantage of, unappreciated. Nobody says thank you. Nobody notices. What's that about? That hurts. Jesus was surrounded by immature, selfish people. You ever lamented to the Lord in prayer? It'd be a whole lot easier to follow him if it weren't for all these idiots that you were surrounded with, right? <laughs> I've never prayed that. I'm just asking if you have, right? <laughs> Right? We think of the apostles and we think of them in stained glass windows with halos around their head. But there's this crazy story in the Gospels of Jesus telling them, I'm going to go suffer and die on the cross for the sins of the whole world. And then right after that, they start arguing with each other about which one of them is going to be the greatest. And who gets to sit on his right and left like a bunch of 12-year-olds arguing who gets to sit shotgun in the van? And Jesus pulls them aside and he goes, guys, it's like that in the world, but it's not like that in the kingdom. Let's talk. And he shows patience and love and mercy and kindness and grace to them. Jesus was misunderstood and called crazy by members of his own family. You ever been misunderstood and called crazy by members of your own family for believing what you believe? Yeah, you're in good company. Jesus was slandered and maligned. Jesus was lied about. We see this picture of his trial in this kangaroo court with all these false charges brought against him. And the Bible says that Jesus was silent and stood before them like a lamb going to the slaughter. Ultimately, Jesus was blindfolded and beaten and mocked. Jesus was whipped and forced to carry his own cross. Jesus died in the most barbaric, inhumane, painful execution that has ever been devised by the human race. Most likely he died through a mix of hypovolemic shock where his organs shut down because he bled out and he literally suffocated on his own fluids. That's what Jesus did. And while he was on the cross, the Bible says he said, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. 
And all the while, soldiers beneath the cross gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. And the most amazing thing is he looks at you and I in the pages of Scripture and he says this to me and you. Follow me. Follow me. Where did we get this idea that somehow this was going to be easy? Brothers and sisters, I need you to hear me. It's going to be worth it, but it's not always going to be easy. And you display his glory, and you prove the authenticity of your faith when you're willing to follow, even when it gets tough to follow. When you're willing to stick through, and you're willing to say, man, it doesn't even pay off. There's no advantages to this in the here and now, but I know it's going to be worth it. And so I'm going to grow in my love for him. I'm going to grow in my love for others. I'm going to forgive people. I'm going to be kind to people. I'm going to hold on to truth. Even when the culture comes against me and says it's intolerant for me to believe this, I'm going to keep following him. That's how we manifest the glory of God in times like these. We need to understand someday everything we go through the suffering, the hardship, the pain, the difficulties, the confusions, everything that we suffer as a follower of Jesus, someday that will be rewarded. We'll stand before him and there's some things that we've done to serve the Lord and things we've done to serve other people and nobody noticed in this life. And Jesus is going to look at us and say, I noticed. Well done. And all the evil and pain and Suffering will be destroyed completely. So in the here and now, let's bring God glory. How do we bring him glory? How do we represent his character well? Let's respond to the hardships and the suffering that we face in a way that looks like Jesus. Some of us are going to go to particularly tense gatherings this week in the homes of family members. Some of us are going to encounter people that say and do ugly things. How are you going to respond? Here's what I found. This is just like a very personal aside. It's really, really easy to be super spiritual around people in your spiritual family, and it's really easy for all that to go out the window when you encounter your physical family. Preach the gospel this week. Preach the gospel this week. How do you preach the gospel? You look like Jesus. Even when it's not easy to look like Jesus, you forgive like Jesus, you love like Jesus, you show mercy and kindness and patience like Jesus, and the unbelieving world will sit up and take notice and say, why are you still following him even when it's tough and it's not paying off? Because he's Lord, and someday he's coming back. I pray for you this morning.